Hi everyone, it's Anne with Art on the Creek. Thanks for joining me today. I've got an old photo album out that my mom made of some of the slides that she took. And uh, I l often look through old pictures when I can't quite decide what to paint. Um, and photos from slides are so clear and so sharp. There's my brother and uh, my dad and my brother. And oh, that's me in the dress down there. And there's my mom and me again. That's cute. But it's not that. It's not us. I don't want to paint a picture of my childhood. I do want to paint an iconic Colorado scene. Been there a million times. It is Maroon Bells. There we go. Are you ready? Let's go do it. If you guys keep painting pictures of my childhood, you're going to see what a weirdo I was. <laughs> but that's okay. We all had our awkward years. Um, I motioned to the right there. What I'll do when I when we start drawing is I will put a split screen of this image up. I'm using 100% cotton B paper, and um, I'm just going to tape it to the back of this board here. I save the backs of watercolor boards and pads because this chipboard is so thick. It's really good. So I like saving these to, to tape paper too, if, um, if it's just loose paper. Sometimes they're not the best at holding the paper, but what you can do is cover them in packing tape and then um, your washi tape will stick to it a little bit better and it also won't be absorbent. So there are ways that you can get around that and uh, have a perfectly usable watercolor board. So I'm just getting this taped. I like using washi tape that has a linear design on it. And this one with little typewriters is perfect because I'm using the roller bar. That's that thing that holds the paper in for those of you who have never used a typewriter. <laughs> I'm using that um, image on the tape as a guide so that I know that my border will be nice and even. I really like finding washi tape that's got um, a linear pattern to it because it's just a nice way to make sure you're getting that border straight. In this split screen image, um, unfortunately you won't be able to see the entire photo edge to edge. I've got the right of it is cut off just a little. So there will be a link in the description to this. I'll put it in my Dropbox. And um, my mother took this picture. No credit needed. You may use this photo however you wish. You may paint something from it and sell the work. Um, I'd appreciate it if you leave my brother and I out. <laughs> But if you want to put your own kids in, that would be great. At any rate, um, here we go. We're just putting in a little sketch and I'm starting with the water line because that's going to be our horizon. And I've got it just below center of the paper. My mom framed this so that the bells are kind of right front and center. And I was going to scoot them over. I was kind of working out how to place it there before I put this uh, split screen up. But I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and keep the image all pretty close to the way she had it framed. I think I will scoot the bells to the right just a little bit because I didn't want them to be dead center there, even though they're the star of the show. I still like to use that rule of thirds as much as I can. So I'm trying to put um, on, on the far right bell, I will put some interesting part of it over toward the right third. So kind of where it slopes down to the right there. You'll see when we get to painting. If you feel that you need to trace this, as always, super simple, just uh, print that link to the photo, print the photo from the link in the Dropbox. Just use black and white, don't use up all your color inter printer ink. And just get it on printer paper, tape it to your window, and then bring a sheet of watercolor paper over to that paper and uh, tape that up as well so that it holds still. And then you can just trace right over that. You don't need to get a light box, you don't need to do anything fancy. Um, and you certainly don't need to be intimidated by drawing because there's a million ways around it. You can do a grid method, you can trace, you can do a uh, some kind of a projector. So there's a lot of different ways. And in fact, if this picture is something that you don't like, there are plenty of pictures of maroon bells online. There are some on Pixabay or um, Unsplash, sites like that, that are definitely specified as free reference photos for artists. But be very careful if you find one on a National Park website or um, you know something about the state of Colorado or Pinterest is someone's Instagram feed, anything like that, because then you will run the risk of uh, infringing upon ownership rights. I am giving you my permission to use this image um, with the exception of the people in the foreground. I really don't want uh, myself or my brother <laughs> out there too much, but uh, I will share it here. So whenever you're painting anything, just make sure that you have permission from uh, the source. The best source you can always use for a reference photo is your own photo. And if you're like me and you can't quite get to up to Maroon Bells this week, then, you know, 
that's why I'm here. Use this photo. Maroon Bells is located in the White River National Forest in the Snowmass Wilderness, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Depending upon which way you drive, it'll either take you about four or five hours, something like that, from the Denver area. Um, but now I believe you have to get reservations. Now, when we were going up and gosh, even when um, our own kids were little, you didn't have to get reservations, but now you do. And I think that's just good advice if you're planning a trip to Colorado or anywhere for that matter any kind of popular site or uh, you know national park anything like that a state park check in advance make sure there are fees that you might have to pay get those covered um, find out where to park because um, you might need a parking permit you might need a pass there's an awful lot of pre-planning that has to be done now and um, takes a little more effort but the payout is definitely worth it the paints that I'm using today are just a mix of my studio paints. I wanted to put them in uh, half pans, and by studio paints, I mean these are the paints I use most often in my studio. It's a mix of M. Graham, Daniel Smith, uh, Holbein, what else do I have in there? A little bit of Winsor Newton. The colors that I'm using chiefly today are Cobalt Teal, and I have two different brands of that, although I didn't write down in here what they are, so that wasn't uh, too forward thinking of me, but I use them all, both and I love them. I'm using an M. Graham Cerulean Blue, a uh, Elysian Crimson, I believe that one is by Core, Q-O-R. I am using a Naples Yellow by M. Graham, Yellow Ochre, that one's M. Graham also. Indigo by Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith Indigo is my absolute favorite indigo. I've tried a lot of them and I really go back to the Daniel Smith because it is the, the darkest. If you use it in a strong enough concentration, your eye can read it as black. A lot of indigos tend up being navy blue, and I prefer to use one that is very, very dark, and the Daniel Smith Indigo really fits that bill. I'm also using a Quinacridone Rust, and then I've got some Jeanne Briand in at the end, and the Quin Rust is uh, Daniel Smith, and the Jeanne Briand is a Holbein color. So right now I'm going to go in with the Sky. I've mixed the Cerulean with Cobalt Teal, and I think I've got a touch of that Naples Yellow in there. I'm not entirely certain but the cerulean was a little too bright and clear and the cobalt was a little too fakey fake so I wanted to capture that blue blue sky but not have it too how can I say it um, too artificial looking so that's what I'm doing right now I'm just going uh, dry and wet I didn't pre-wet the sky I'm using my silver black velvet brushes because I haven't used them in a long time and I wanted to reuse them this number eight does have a very nice point my favorite brushes are the Princeton Neptune and chiefly because of the point they get and I can use a uh, number eight Princeton Neptune and create an entire painting but um, including the detail I mean but the silver black velvet, I just haven't used them in a while and I wanted to kind of refresh my memory to see because I, I really used to love them. They have an interesting pull across the, the paper that just feels a little bit different than my, uh, my Princeton Neptune. And it's just, it's fine, it just feels different. So I was kind of surprised actually to notice that subtlety, just that little bit of difference there. Uh, so if you change the kind of brush that you're used to using, you might notice that as well. I went into the sky first with the shade and I, I knew it was going to be too light. So I went in with, again, with the cerulean. And the thing about M. Graham paints is because they have a honey base to them, they re-wet very nicely, which is wonderful for people like me here in a dry climate of Colorado. But then when they're wet and they sit there, they are really, really ready to go. So that was that big blob of paint that uh, that you saw going on there. So now I'm just kind of trying to distribute that a little bit more evenly and get that sky to look uh, a little more flat without a whole lot of streaks in it. I wasn't able to get them out completely, but I'm pretty happy with the results. So don't sweat it. If you can't get something looking perfect, you're just going to end up overworking your painting. So the best thing to do is just to leave that area and move on to somewhere else. So now what I'm going to look at is the water. It's so interesting when you're painting water, especially my big experience is painting in Colorado. So that's the example I'm going to use. We have a lot of iron in our, in our water. Our rocks are, are high in iron. And in fact, a lot of the mountain streams, you can really smell it. But you can see in the back there, there the water is almost a turquoise blue. It's naturally reflecting the sky. So I wanted to put that in and I'm going a little bit conservatively because I want to be able to reflect that light, make the water 
differentiate from the sky, but I also am going to have to make it darker toward the front. So that's why I really like this quinacridone rust oil. I'm also going to use a burnt sienna from uh, M. Graham. Sorry, Daniel Smith. It's not M. Graham. It is Daniel Smith. Doesn't matter. They're all really quite nice. I like the burnt siennas that are BR7. The ones that are PR, pigment red 101, tend to be a little too orangey for my taste. So I really like this Quinn Rust. I also use a red iron oxide often. And um, I just think for the landscapes that I paint, it just really picks up the natural pigments and um, the natural tone of those pigments in the earth rather. And that makes sense because we have a lot of iron oxide. So I'm using the Quinn Rust and the iron oxide to create this brownish tint in the water. And now I'll go in with some indigo and kind of get some shadows going. You can, if you look really closely at that water, I mean, you know, we can see the light reflecting off of it, but there are some shadows and I drew in space for the rocks, but I painted right over them. And that's going to be something that I kind of regretted for a hot minute um, toward the end of the painting, but I ended up uh, fixing it. So <laughs> do that at your own risk. You can use masking fluid to mask off some of the areas that you don't want to cover with paint. Um, you can also use uh, masking tape to cut it in a shape that you like. But um, I just wanted to get right in and start painting. I didn't want to mess around with some masking fluid. So I'm just going right over these. And uh, had I made my pencil lines a little bit darker, I don't think it would have, I would have had the issues that I did. But nonetheless, it worked out just fine. So I'm just putting in the shadows first. I've got the mid values in with the water. And now I'm putting in uh, the dark shadows and I'm just kind of suggesting where they are. I'm not really uh, committing to everything yet. I'm just kind of blocking in. And now I'm going to go do some of that blocking in with the mountains. Now here's where I found it so interesting that the silver black velvet for me was harder to do my very favorite dry brush technique. So I stuck it out. I tried to do it for much of the painting, but uh, it ended up being just... Um, a kind of a hold your brush sideways technique. I couldn't really get a lot of dry brush from it, but for these particular mountains, it turned out to be okay because I had a plan to go in at the end with gouache and put the snow in that way. This is a fun mix. I just took uh, the colors that were there on my palette and I've mixed in some alizarin crimson. There is a slight pink tone under these rocks. I'm not 100% certain if the camera hasn't faded because I don't remember them being quite as pink. I remember them being really, really gray, but I wanted to go ahead and depict them with that pink because it certainly would be plausible to have that in our Colorado mountains. And you can see that it's definitely reflecting up from the water there. Um, we're standing on the lake floor, so you can see how uh, how shallow that lake is right there. And uh, snow up there on the mountains, as always, and we're in shorts. It was probably a beautiful 80, 90 degree day. And I am betting that it is, oh gosh, this time of year. It's probably early April or May when, uh, when this picture was taken. My mom didn't put a date uh, of the month that it was taken, but... Um, we used to always go up and, and we would go camping. It might even have been June because my dad was an elementary school principal and we took our family vacations when he was not teaching, when school was out of session. So um, by the looks of my hair, it looks like I probably slept in a tent <laughs> and uh, we were probably camping. So maybe it was later in the year than that. Springtime in the Rockies, as the song goes, doesn't come until mid-June or July. So it's highly plausible that this was even later in the summer. Now I've added in some yellow ochre. I love using yellow ochre in mountain ranges. And you can see as I'm adding this, how naturally uh, vibrant that makes the, the light and shadows. I've got it thin enough that the previous wash that I put on there will shine through and create some lovely natural shadows and slopes. And what you wanna do when you're painting mountains, just like when you're painting animal fur, you want to move your brush in the direction of the gravity of the slope. So if you're working with a slope that is mostly straight and down, straight up and down, that's the way you want to use your brush, move your brush. Gosh, can't talk today, sorry. 
if your uh, cliff is sloping to the left, you want to start in the upper right and pull down to the left. And the converse of that, if your uh, cliff is sloping to the right, you want to start in the upper left and pull it down to the lower right. And here you can see I'm trying and not being very successful with that dry brush technique. I know that I had uh, a little bit wet paint on here, but I also am positive that if I were using a brush I was more familiar with, I could have gotten this to work. Um, so I'm just going to try tapping things in instead because this is going to be a base shadow layer and uh, I can go back and fill in the details here. Um, this is an indigo added to that same mix. I'm just kind of gradually adding pigments to that main mix that I was using because I find that when you mix these colors, see there's some dry brush worked on that one and then there it didn't. So, you know, what are you going to do? Um, I just kept going. That's what you're going to do. So at any rate, what I was telling you about mixing the paints, I like to have the paints that I'm using, particularly in landscapes, I will use one big space on my palette and just keep mixing. And what I like about that is that when you, when you mix those pigments and you continue to build on them, they really do create a more cohesive painting, number one, but it creates a more unified landscape because even though you see dirt and rocks and trees as separate things, you would ask someone, what color are the rocks? Brown. What color is the dirt? Kind of reddish. What color are the trees? Green. But through those trees, you really can see the grass, which is a lighter green, which is growing on that dirt, which has some brown under it. So all of these layers of colors really do pop back into our eyes and they register in our brain, but overall we don't see them. But when you paint them that way, and when you include those subtle colors that are underneath, you will end up with a much more uh, uh, a much more representational painting of what you're what you're trying to represent and it will uh, it'll have a lot more depth it'll have a lot more interest and a lot more texture so speaking of texture that's what we're doing here with the rocks now and I'm going in with pretty much a dark indigo all of these uh, washes or layers if you will of what I'm putting on are not all that thick just yet I'm still keeping the paint fairly sheer and you can see I am kind of uh, moving my brush to the left side where the the big peaks are the bells I have moved the brush left to right pretty much and then over here on the right I'm going in an up and down motion. A little bit of right and left there, right there. But for the large part it is up and down because you can see the texture of the rocks changes just a little bit. It doesn't have that great slant to it. There's still that uh, horizontal layer of striation but those pillars are more vertical so I want to suggest that in the painting. Mother Nature has been very kind to us with this iconic view which is probably why it's so iconic. Do you see how the hill just really comes down almost to the center and just lead your eye right back up into those three beautiful, beautiful peaks? That's just a gift and we're going to capitalize on that. I've brought into that same mix some Cascade Green, which is one of my absolute favorite paints in the world. I absolutely love it. Um, this one's a Daniel Smith and it is a mix of PB15 which is Thalo Blue and PBR7 which they say is a burnt umber. It can also be a burnt sienna but in this case it's a burnt umber. So if you have a Thalo Blue and a burnt umber you can mix this yourself and I would recommend playing with it in big puddles of water because since it's a dual pigment like that, it does separate out into those two separate pigments and you get some beautiful, beautiful striations of color. Now I've got some yellow ochre added to the mix and I'm just kind of trying to bring some sunlight into uh, into the situation back here because when you look carefully at that grass, there's a little bit of yellow back there in the center just off to the left and as it gets closer to the lake, actually when you look off to the right, uh, those two people over there on the right, by the way, in the photo are strangers. I don't know who they are. Um, but at any rate, you've got this uh, this other grass, different kind of grass that has a little bit more yellow in it. And we all wanted to go ahead and reflect that as well. And then overall, looking at the Cascade Green, maybe it was just that uh, I needed to practice the dry brush technique a little bit with this silver black velvet brush because I did get it to work pretty well. Um, even when painting something that looks fairly solid like grass, I like using that dry brush technique because you can naturally create a lot of subtle variances in color. And that's just what I'm doing over here to the right on that rocky beach. I wanted to put most of the pigment there um, close to the shore and then use water to pull it out. And I don't know if you noticed there, I, I got the pigment a little bit in the lake worked out to be perfect because then I could take some water and 
push that out into the lake and create a shadow from the shore. So that worked out very well. Uh, just going in with more of that dirt texture and that's the same mix I had uh, with the initial mountains with the alizarin crimson. And uh, just trying to get that tape to stay adhered to this board. I think I will go up after this and cover this guy with uh, packing tape so that it'll have something a little bit better to adhere to. And now I've mixed some of that uh, yellow ochre in there to just really lighten that up. And we're getting just a different level of green yet again to fill in some of the undergrowth. And now while this is wet, I'm going to drop in the more of the love of my life, more of this cascade green, and just kind of uh, do a little damp into wet there and let that migrate just a touch. When you're working on any kind of hillside, you also want to be conscious of the angle of your brush. Now I'm trying to pull it in the direction. You'll see that my brush angles to be parallel with the slope where it's up to the left, horizontal, and then up to the right. So that's another good tip for you. I'm just kind of trying to put in different layers and now I'm putting in the suggestion of the trees. Now that I've got the different layers of the grasses in, I can start to put in the very basis for the trees. I'm not doing any detail yet. I'm just kind of saying, okay, here's where I'm going to put some trees in the very near future. Um, as I always say, I'm not a realistic painter. This is uh, not going to be a good tutorial for you if you're looking for photorealism. I prefer to um, take a painterly approach. And I think I've got some uh, indigo mixed into that now, into that brown. Um, or maybe I went in with a darker brown of the mountains. At any rate, adding some dark tones to the very center there. So back to what I was saying about photorealism. That is not something that I enjoy doing. I am enamored of it, but it is not my style. So this is going to be a very loose representation of maroon bells. However, you'll be able to definitely tell that's what it is. Putting some more of the gold ochre, the yellow ochre on the hillside there on the right to get the sun reflecting off of these rocks. Really, they're, they're pretty much washed out and white in the photo, but um, I didn't want to leave white rocks because it would look like snow in this case, especially since I'm going to go back in at the end and add gouache for the snow. Um, what I wanted to do is uh, get that, get the warmth, the feeling from the rocks there. So yellow ochre, again, is a really good one to use for expressing warmth in a painting. Well, I've got some paper towels or you can use rags. I've got them torn and placed over everything I don't want to get messy. So you know what that means, folks. It's splatter time. I'm mixing up some darker brown and I'm going to splatter in some of the rocks. There, The beach here is, if you can call it that, shore, is very rocky because the rocks have fallen down, I guess, um, glacially. That's how this was all formed. That's why you have that great divot in the, in the slope there. Um, but at any rate, I wanted to put these rocks in and rather than paint each one, I'm just doing some splatter. And it turns out to be a really easy way to get some definition on your, uh, on your hillside there. So adding a little bit of dark here in an area where the shadow would be. In, my, uh, in the thoughts of my painting here, this is kind of backlit, when you look at uh, my brother and I, you can see our shadows going off to the right, but in my painting, I am changing that light. I am making it so that it's kind of coming towards you. So the things that would have shadows um, are going to be the edges of the, the shoreline and the front of the rocks. So be aware of that. Be aware of how your shadows fall. It's perfectly all right to change that light if you don't like the way it's going. Um, but... Uh, in, this, in something like this, the reason that I wanted that light coming toward us more is because I wanted to make that defined line where the shoreline hits the water. Now it's time to focus a little bit more on the water itself. Here is where your dry brush technique will come in very, very handy because when you leave these naturally skipped over spaces, or if you don't fill everything in, you're going to be able to catch a lot of those natural highlights on the water without having to add them back in later. If you do end up accidentally filling it in, of course, you can always go through with some gouache or you can take uh, an X-Acto blade and uh, scratch it in gently. One of these days I will show you how to do that uh, without cutting your watercolor paper, but um, it does leave some, some permanent texture on it though, so be aware of that. But 
Today we're not going to use that technique. I'm just going to use some of this dry brush and get a little bit more of this warmth in the front here. And this is a, uh, using that Quin Rust with a little bit of the Elysian and Crimson and Indigo mixed into it. Uh, there might be some yellow ochre in there as well. Just kind of trying to drag these colors across so that I can pick up those natural highlights and um, also indicate where the changes in depths and shadow of the, of the lake are. Uh, I've got some indigo going in here as well. And uh, let's see what we can figure out next. I just continued that along the entire surface of the lake. And now it's time to focus on the trees. Now, a lot of these trees are really quite far away. And I also have some grasses there that I want to put in. So I am splaying the bristles of my brush and just lightly putting these in. These will be some taller grasses, maybe some suggestions of trees. Just something off in the distance that your eye can tell that it's taller than the other undergrowth. So this is a good way to establish where you're going to place things on your horizon in your landscape that may be of a different scale than what, uh, what you can see more clearly. Um, I use these as markers. I use these as grass or reeds. If you use them up close, they can be definite grasses. But here for this, I'm just using them as distant plants. So it's a really good technique to use. One thing you always want to be conscious of is that things farther away from you are going to be much smaller. So these little taps I'm making right here are full grown pine trees. They are so small though, because they're very far away. So that gives us a good sense of depth and perspective to let us know how far away these mountains are, even though they're so majestic, they look like you could reach out and touch them. And in our reference photo here, of course, we can see a lot more detail on this little uh, grove of pines right here. Um, so we'll add just a little bit more there. You know, it's funny. I saw another artist from Colorado uh, paint the maroon bells. And she had a recent picture, I think. And I want to say that that entire hillside on the left is just filled with pine trees. It sure wasn't when I was there. So it's kind of neat to see in a lifetime um, how much the forest changes. I call this method, are you ready for it? Tapping in trees. <laughs> I have no idea what the actual name for this technique is, and I don't think it matters. I'm just holding my brush vertically and kind of um, above my work, and I'm just using the very tip of it to tap that suggestion of a tree in. And I won't add the uh, little horizontal pieces to suggest the pine needles unless the trees are really quite close up. And those are the ones I did on the left side. But these are just going to be little tapped in trees, and that'll do it for the forest over here. Now that I've got the trees in, it's time to work on the beach over here on the other side. And again, it's not really a beach, I guess, just a lakeshore might be a more accurate depiction. And same thing, we're just going to splatter in some darker shade to get some rocks. And those rocks that have landed in the water, we can just kind of blend those in and just make them a little bit blurred. They're okay. We don't need to see them and we don't need to totally lift them out. They're fine where they are. I did repeat that just a tiny bit over on the right side. And now it's time to block in these bigger rocks. Now I've lost my drawing of them and I don't want to redraw them. So just kind of trying to fill in larger squarish boulders. And I've got uh, four of them. It'll look like three though when they're grouped because I've got one and then two together and another one. So right now I've just gone in with some yellow ochre and I've put down just the basic area of where I want to uh, make those rocks. And just like with the mountains now, I'm going to go in with that reddish mix. And this is probably, I think it was a little bit of the Quin Rust and some Alizarin Crimson and a touch of Indigo. And I'm not covering the entire uh, square of this imaginary rock shape I have in my mind. I'm also looking at the reference a little bit just to remind myself of what the rocks look like there. But, you know, if your area has round rocks and you want to do your own lake, then definitely um, paint your rocks that way. But now I'm going in with uh, some Indigo to kind of get the geometric shape basically defined on these rocks. I'm not filling anything in too square. I'm just kind of putting in the layers, the striations on the rocks. Now I've dried that with a heat tool and here's where I'm going in with the Jaune Brillant mixed with the colors that I've already put in there. I wanted to kind of get that flat warm texture to the rocks and I'm going to add a little bit of this to the rocky shores and then kind of lift it up. I just want to have a subtle amount of the Jaune Brillant mixed with the browns that I've already got going and I'll just reflect it very subtly on the lake shores. I guess not literally reflect, I should say repeat because um, there could be reflections here. 
Now we'll go ahead and uh, emphasize those striations and the shadows generated from the rocks and that way I can establish that they are in the water but the water is very shallow. So that's what that blue line on the bottom there of the indigo will do for you. You've got all of that darker water over here to the right and you can see where the lake turns blue is where it gets deeper and here you could walk in this water and um, sit on those rocks. And by setting those rocks up that way, we can really invite our viewer into our painting. We can really set the scene to let people know what it's like to be in this location. And that's where this white gouache comes in. Uh, we're going to go ahead and paint the snow up on the higher elevations, uh, but not on the lower elevations where it's green and there's clearly grass growing. So this will also be able to indicate what time of year it is and uh, what the Rockies look like at this point in time. So I've got a good amount of gouache on here and I've splayed my brush out and I'm just going to try and uh, scrape this, for lack of a better word, I'm going to gently paint this snow across these maroon bells to try and pick up those striations and different grooves and capture how the sun has melted the snow in some areas but it's still there in others. So I'll skip ahead through this and we can see where this ends up. You can see I just continue to use that uh, splayed bristle technique as well as just painting in some very narrow stripes. And now I've mixed just a touch of blue with that gouache and I'm putting in just some of the lighter shaded snowy areas. This by adding the blue will help to convey when it's said and done, I hope, um, a little bit more of a cooler temperature. We've got the warmth of the water in front and the rocky beaches and now I want to convey how uh, cold it would be if you went back up there into the hills. I went over some of those with some white just to give it some depth and I kind of like the way that turned out. I think that's enough on the hills for now. Now let's take some of this same gouache and let's skip over the water with that horizontal dry brush technique and let's get some of these highlights in here. This is also going to end up looking a bit like the mountain reflection in the water. So I'm taking some um, artistic license but when you look back at the photo, the light is reflected on the water pretty brightly just to the left of where my brother and I are standing in the picture. So it would be our right, your left as you're looking at the picture. So by pulling the dry brush technique over here in the gouache, I am able to establish some of that reflection. And if I do it in a careful enough shape, I can reflect the bells just a little bit, which is what I was trying to do. Typically when you work in watercolor or any other art medium for that matter, you will finish an area and then realize another area needs some tweaking. So that's what I'm doing after I've got the highlights in the water. I'm noticing that I want to add some of those highlights up on the rocky shore and on those larger uh, rocks in front as well. So I'm just very lightly putting those in and then um, just kind of tweaking them a little bit just to make sure that they're not too garish but that they definitely show some of those beautiful reflections of the sun. And now I'm going to go back in with some indigo and just kind of tighten up this shoreline a little bit. I'm not making a solid line and there is uh, an area in the center that I'm leaving open. But I do want to add some of these uh, little water shadows here suggesting that there is a slight current here over on this uh, right hand side and it would just be a current from the breeze that's blowing by. So I'm also going to intensify some of these shadows in front of the rocks. And then I think it's just about done. Take the tape off and there you go. I always like to use a heat tool when I take off the tape because even though it's a low tack tape, I don't want it to pull my paper off. And uh, with this B paper, I've had really good luck, but you never know and uh, better safe than sorry. So here you go, guys. Here is my version of Maroon Bells. And I hope you had fun painting with me today. Creating this painting has really made me want to relive some of these trips that I took when I was little with my family. Um, so I think we've got some pretty drives coming up. And uh, boy, that'd be fun to kind of show you the before and after picture. And maybe we can do some plein air this summer. I'm so looking forward to spring. I hope it's warm where you are. And if you decide to paint this Maroon Bells painting, go ahead and tag me on Instagram. I would love to see your work. You guys, I've so enjoyed showing this to you today. And I hope that you are enjoying painting along with me. And maybe you've learned something along the way. I certainly hope that's true too. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for joining me. Bye now.